This is frequency response example number one. Find the steady state response to a sum of sinusoidal inputs. Here we have a linear time invariant system with an input x, an output y, and an impulse response h of n. We are looking first for the frequency response h of e to the j omega. Let's picture the system. The system has frequency response h of e to the j omega with an input x and an output y. We can find the frequency response from the impulse response like this. Let's sum from k equals minus infinity to positive infinity of h of k times e to the minus j omega k. Now we have specific values for h of n. We have an implied coefficient of 1 and this takes place at n equals zero. With this delayed impulse, we see that the coefficient is two at n equals one and three at n equals two. We can then put these into the summation. We would have one times e to the minus j omega, taking k equals zero, we would write this. We take our next coefficient, e to the minus j omega times one, and then three times e to the minus j omega times two. In part b, we are looking for the steady state output when we have the given x of n. We see that there are three components. We have a dc component. This occurs at omega equals zero. We have one sinusoidal component with frequency pi over four radians per sample. And then we have a second sinusoid with frequency three pi divided by four radians per sample. With these essentially three different frequencies, we need to use superposition. That means we would find the individual response of the system to each of these three input components. For example, we could evaluate our frequency response that we found earlier at dc, or taking omega equals zero. e raised to the zero power is simply one, so we see that that sums to six. That would tell us that the output then is uh, the system response at dc, which is six, times the DC input, which is minus two. And that would give us a result of minus 12. Now in a similar way, we can, have, we can apply the sinusoidal input for frequency pi over four. This means we evaluate the frequency response at this particular frequency, pi over four. Every place that we see an omega, we drop in pi over four. We can then evaluate this to some complex value, and it will have an amplitude and a phase. Now the amplitude of that complex value amounts to the gain, and the phase is the phase shift applied to the input sinusoid. Let me call these G and P. Then our response due to this particular sinusoidal input would be the input amplitude times the gain. We would then have cosine of pi over four times n, so we operate at the same frequency. And then we would take our input phase and add the phase shift that we calculated that is due to the, the system. All right, that's the overall approach. We would uh, do essentially the same operation for the second sinusoid. And then with superposition, we simply sum the individual responses. All right, let's move along to the detailed solution. Our frequency response from the impulse response is sum of k equals minus infinity to positive infinity h of k times e to the minus j omega k. Now we recognize that the coefficient of one occurs at n equals zero. 
So that would be at the k equals zero index. Our coefficient two takes place at k equals one. And our last coefficient of three, which is located at n equals two, means that we are looking at k equals two in the summation. Now let me write this in a bit of a simplified form. And that gives us our results for part A. Now this ends up serving as the beginning of part B as does the specific input for X of N. We have a DC component. This takes place at omega equals zero. We have another component at pi over four radians per sample and a third component at three pi over four radians per sample. I need to evaluate the frequency response at each of these three different frequencies. I'll begin by evaluating at DC. This is when omega equals zero. Every place that I see omega, I'll drop in a zero. Now we recognize that E raised to the zero is simply one. And that takes that out to one as well. Adding the results, we have a value of six. And this tells us that the system has a gain of six at DC. Now let me move on to the second component at omega equals pi over four. Again, I start with my generic frequency response equation and then drop in pi over four for omega. Now let's visualize these complex values. To begin with, minus pi over four looks like this. We see a projection onto the real axis and you can use your calculator to find that, but it's 0.7071. And then we have a projection onto the imaginary axis of minus 0.7071. Again, with your calculator, you would want to key in one at angle minus pi over four, and then do a polar to rectangular conversion. Now, this term is pi over two, and that angle, when we account for the negative sign, would look like this. In this case, we see that the projection is zero on the real axis and one, or actually minus one, on the imaginary axis. If I add up all my real parts and consolidate those together, I get 2.414. Then adding up all of the imaginary parts, I get minus 4.414, and I'll convert that into polar form. Let me keep that result and then we'll move on to the third component. We need to find the frequency response at omega equals three quarters pi. So as before, we drop in that specific frequency into our generic expression. Again, I think it's helpful to visualize these complex values. E to the minus j three quarters pi looks like a vector at this angle. We see that it's Real projection is negative, as is the imaginary projection. This frequency, two times three quarters pi, well, that's going to amount to three halves pi. When we account for the negative sign, we get an angle that takes us from minus pi all the way around to minus one and one half pi. This complex value then is simply j. And as before, we can add the real and imaginary parts and then convert that to polar form. And now we have the response at that uh, frequency associated with our third component. Now we can find the individual responses. So the input has a DC value of minus two our system multiplies that by a gain value of six, and we end up with minus 12. 
Now for an input amplitude of three, we multiply that by our system gain to get 15.09. And the phase shift, or we, we say what's the original phase, it's pi over three. We then add in the shift caused by the system. And that amounts to a rather small phase shift. Lastly, we have a component with an amplitude of 10. We multiply that by the system gain at this frequency. The phase is whatever we started with on the input, plus the phase shift introduced by the system at this frequency. Now with these values, we're in a position then to write the finished expression for the output. We have y of n equals the DC component of minus 12 plus 15.09 times cosine. We use the same frequency, pi over four times n, plus the phase shift that we calculated at that frequency. And then for the third component, we have a value of 16.39, multiplying cosine of 3 quarters pi times n, and the phase that we calculated for the output is this value right here. All right, and that takes care of this problem.